All right, welcome to Sings Gallery, everybody. It's March 23rd. The um, add yourself as attendee, please. And please add your topics. Okay, uh, we're gonna start off with uh, analyzing the performance job. Um, and I specifically, I think what we should do is like, let's lay, why don't you start with, you know, talking about some of the work we've been doing, some of the graphs and um, kind of like the new way we eventually wanna analyze these things. Sure. Um, do you mind if I share my screen? Yeah, go ahead. Take it away. Sure. <clears throat> Can you um, see my IDE? Yep. Okay. So um, today I would like to talk a little bit about um, some of the new tools that um, we are working on to um, analyze the um, scale result, like analyze the results that are run by SIG performance jobs. Um, so there are two major buckets of jobs that we run. One is the uh, pre-submits, which are run on which can be optionally run on every PR and the other is uh, periodics every day. Um, there is a job, a six scale job, which will run three times and give us some results that we have been reviewing here. Um, so instead of going and manually reviewing, um, we've been trying to um, work on a tool which can give us a nice graph. So, I have opened the tool here and I just wanted to go through some of the um, phases of this tool and, and the results from this. So the way I'm thinking about this tool is in three phases. Phase one will go uh, look at each job and collect its results and put it in this um, directory. So the Output format will be the directory name slash result slash job name. Uh, so this uh, is here. Uh, output history, periodic, cube word, end to end, um, SIG performance. And then under each, this is the job name and this is the job ID which was run. And for each job ID, we will get the um, VMI results and um, the VM results. So this is directly scraped from uh, from the buildlog.txt. In the future, this phase might go away because we might have the ability to dump this uh, values that are observed in an artifact directory. This is this was suggested in in one of the threads. So this phase might be a little bit easier. We don't have to scrap, scrape the buildlog.txt for results. So moving on from there, um, we can do lots of things with this data. One of the initial steps that um, I took a shot at is to aggregate this data into weekly um, averages and then plot it on, on a graph. So the phase two of this tool is another subcommand that will aggregate the results of this per, um, per resource. And it will give a summary of, of the um, average. So then this will be output history weekly subdirectory. And in that, let's check the VMI. Um, the one of the interesting metric here is creation to um, running p95 so if you look at this directory the subcommand uh, creates multiple directories which is the starting monday of each week and within that we have results so the start date is here the average is here and within within this data structure, there are data points for each date, right? So you can go through this and figure out what are the um, the data points and what its average is. But really this is a pre-processing for the next phase, which is plotting this thing in a chart. Um, 
So the way I have CI Health already had a good tool that would um, put this data into two in 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 a single plot. Um, it would draw a scatter points for these values and then a line line chart for the averages across uh, the weeks. So now I would like to show phase three, which is the result of this aggregation. Um, so this is the weekly VMI to running P95 for, for VMI. You can see that right around this time, the performance of the weekly uh, creation to running um, degraded a little bit because these, um, there are some observations where uh, it went to around 39, 40 seconds. And then right around this, uh, oops, right around this is when we got back. So there is a, there is actually two ways to plot this in, in the subcommand. One is to get static graph. Um, other is to get a plotly um, graph. So this is much more dynamic. It creates an HTML output. And here you can figure out where exactly things started to get bad and where it, it got better. So one thing we have been trying to do over the past um, week is we know when things got bad, which is December 22 to um, 23, 2022. And we know when things got good, December, uh, sorry, January 22 to January 23, 2023. So we're trying to vet each PR in there and find out the culprit. Uh, we do have like a couple of um, PR pairs um, that, that we have a suspicion on, but we were not able to confirm uh, from um, one or the other. So yeah, that's that's the VMI creation to running. Um, I do have a couple of other um, interesting observations. Um, so this is the second chart. Um, this chart is weekly patch pods count for, for the VMI. Uh, right around this week, the patch for VMI was um, doubled. So initially for each VMI, we had one patch pods count. Now we are having two. Um, similarly, if, uh, sorry, wrong plot. Similarly, if you look for the patch count, on pods uh, from VM, it also follows the same trend. Uh, so this allows us to see that, okay, something in the uh, code base changed right around this time, which increased one uh, patch count for the VMI. We were actually able to pinpoint what that change was um, and we'll share more details in, in the six scale talk um, next week. Another observation from this tool was that um, patch counts for uh, virtual machines, virtual machine instances. So this is on the left, the chart is the patch count for virtual machine instances if the VMI was created via VM controller. You can see that there were increase in the patch calls um, First week of February and second week of February, there were two spikes. But if you, um, I do not have the right chart here. Let me get that. So if you look at the same plot uh, for VMI, so this plot is if you if a user creates VMI manually, uh, the patch counts for VMI remain stable, right? So there were two changes that when went in 
uh, in the way VM controller manages uh, virtual machines. And because of two, those two changes, this patch count um, increased. Again, um, we'll share more details in the six scale talk um, next week, but just wanted to give a, a overview of this tool, uh, the phases and, and the output. Yeah, um, so if you guys have any questions or feedback um, on, on things to change or things to we can do better, please share. Hi, um, I mean, this is great. And thank you for taking the task on. Um, I just have a question. Do we actually track or bake in what um, what PRs are for the pre-submits? Yes, we do. So the, the results that I have churned right now, these are uh, for periodics. Um, there is some improvement to be done for running the same thing against PR. So um, the pre-submits are yet, the pre-submits uh, data is organized a little bit differently than the periodics in, in the GCS bucket. So I had not gotten a chance yet to go um, modify this tool to look at the pre-submits. But once I do, um, we should be able to get the PR number in here. And I, I think the better um, place to put it is in this interactive chart. So if somehow we can associate a PR number with these dots, then we should be easily able to figure out like what, what this dot is doing or what this dot is doing or, or something like that. So that's the, that's the direction I'm moving towards. Perfect. And I think uh, even what uh, Ryan is writing, um, maybe have a PRs uh, in the periodic. So for example, what PRs went in, in within, the, within the week we are putting the, uh, we are putting the graph. It will be also uh, interesting to see. Yeah, that's, yeah. So I think we might, yeah. Mm. Do we have that data in the pro job uh, that gets run or is that something that has to be collected outside with, with a separate uh, GitHub utility? So if you are going to plot the graph uh, once per week, so for example, let's say Friday, uh, we can use the GitHub client to actually uh, query what PRs got in in this week and then include it in, into the plot. Got it, makes sense. Okay, yeah, that, that, that will be very helpful. Yeah, you'll have to, um, yeah, okay, so you, oh, you could do this on the client side. I see, okay, I, I got, because yeah, it was, I was gonna say like, we could do this based on time frame, or you can include it in the periodic, but I think what you just said makes sense, the time frame where like, you query again, and it's like, we're doing it weekly, we check what's been merged in a week, and if someone were to do this like every three days is their time frame, which I, I think is allowed in your tool, the way you set it up a lay, then it'd be the same thing, we would grab it by every three day periods or something what PRs were merged in those chunks of time. Yeah, so I, I think that might be, so this CI, CI Health might already be doing this, right? So we, we might have some uh, code written to, to pull this PRs. I, I'm not sure, but I, I'm trying to think it aloud because I know like CI Health, uh, does some processing on, on the PRs that went in. It might have utility and we can take it from there. Yeah, we definitely have this. Okay, awesome. Okay. Okay, cool. um, is there any other, um, is there any other call, I mean, 
metric that you would like to see um i've tried to look at the major ones and these are the ones that popped out but I, i'm not sure if i missed anything there are lots of here, these here i actually wanted to ask if we do want to track all of it maybe the, do we want to i don't know maybe use fuel which we know that might affect the performance a lot and then others would be not collected maybe and we could just take this on demand if we see that something spiked up and it's not as uh, usual suspect yeah that's interesting <clears throat> because so I... at, at what would be the right phase to drop this uh, If we drop this at the data collection layer, then we will not have the data to look back and, and um, analyze later on, right? Right. I we... mean, um, we don't we don't have a garbage collection on the job, so technically we would not lose it yet. Um, so we could drop it there, or we could uh, drop it on the uh, post processing or post collecting right so i think that is the the garbage collection what i have found in the gcs bucket is that the periodics we only have around 15 16 weeks of data but the pre submits is where we have um, all of the history until now so something cleans up the data in in periodic um, directory uh, in the bucket. OK. I mean, I wouldn't be against dropping in just after the collecting phase. OK. And did you, um, did you think about what graphs do we want to publish? Or do we, do we want to publish all of them? I mean, um, maybe most of the interesting ones would be the P90, P95 for um creation to running right that's uh, yes. that's most interesting most interesting yes and then um i think operations as the uh, as least patch um that would be something to look after or look at yes so i think historically um, i've tried to look at what um calls have been troublesome and I think there was patch node counts or so, something related to nodes that had been troubling us. Uh, I think that might also be interesting to- Yeah, publish. yes, that's, that's also the case because usually those calls are in weird handler, which, well, that's multiplying by number of nodes and usually people try to put into the some kind of routine, so based on some frequency, which then is just a storm for the API. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I, I had, I actually was thinking to add some more uh, metrics to this. To, so, for example, um, CPU and memory utilization of uh, word handler. Um, and word launcher. Um, those are the two things that would be nice to have plotted over time, just so we can have an idea of how uh, the memory consumption and the CPU consumption of our components are evolving at scale. Um, those might be some metrics we would have to um, figure out in the audit tool and then populate here. I agree. That can be very interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's all I had. So I've gotten the notes for the um, the graph. So we got list, get, create, patch, update of VMIs, VMs, pods, node counts. We could also do, I mean, I don't know about any other ones like 
PVCs. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Oh, hold on. You're covering the you're covering the thing I was looking at. Oh, I was okay. Looking at your I, folder. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. You can move it up. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, like, what else do we think makes sense in here? Like, I mean, limit ranges. I don't think so. Oh, Qbert's jobs. No. Game and sets, config maps. I mean, most of this stuff is endpoints. I remember endpoints is a high one that's high. I just don't remember if it's one that is has any correlation to anything else. Virtual machines. Yeah. Do you want to migrations? Endpoint plot. Do you have the plot? Is it any, is there anything interesting yeah. you see there? I don't know. I haven't seen. Let's see. Oh, it's a flat line. Yeah, migrations. Okay. I just remember there's a lot of them. So it just seemed like, you know, you probably want to be responsible with this since we're using a lot. Yeah. I so I look, this is around 74 megabytes of data for 16 week. So yeah, it, it can fill up really quickly. Uh, if we don't, like we, we might have to have a garbage collector soon if we continue to publish all this, so. Yeah, I think what we're gonna have to do, I, I, I almost feel like we're gonna have to, we can't, we can't, we can't keep, we're gonna maybe have to do some, I forget what phase it is, but whatever it is that when we commit it to get, we, I think what we do is we keep only the ones that we have here designated in the, um, here, sorry, I'll share. I'm highlighting something and sure. I'm gonna grab it from you. There, I like I think this is kind of like our regex, is that we keep we keep this, and then as we see, you know, if we see any other weird things by just analyzing the job, because like we do, like Lupo was saying, like we could if we wanted to go back and look at the the actual job and look at the plain text, we could see it there and we can always add more later if we find anything strange. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. All right, yeah, let's start with those. My, that's, that's cool. Yeah, my only um, thought would be to be careful with the data as to if we want to get other calls in the future, we should, even if we don't publish it, we should leave out doors for us open to process it later. Um, and I think, um, it was mentioned that we don't garbage collect it at the bucket layer, so we should be fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, pretty cool. Thanks, Alaya. All right, and yeah, like you said, we'll, we'll be talking some more about this and Hubert Summit. We'll have yeah. some more on this and some graphs and stuff. Okay. Um, or in some PRs that go along with the graphs. Okay, uh, what else do we want to have? That was the topic I, no, the topic I have. Um, Eli, did you want to talk anything about some of the things that, um, or anything with to do with the Windows scans? Um, so, um, if we, I can discuss in general what we do today around the QBird. So uh, we have a, and the last, uh, the last workload we had is uh, called Bootstorm. We test uh, the time. It's close to your test with 100, 100 VM. Uh, uh, but we test uh, in parallel the total memory allocation per VM and per node. Uh, and the total CPU, we fetch it directly from Prometheus for specific run. And we run it um, twice a week to see that we get a stable result against latest, uh, latest cluster, uh, OpenShift cluster. Um, and so we start to test Fedora uh, around the uh, 300 VM and our limitation in general is the memory and we configure the 
request memory to 128 mega in order to make uh, to run uh, the maximum of uh, Fedora VM. Um, and in uh, Windows VM, we run around um, one run 100 and, uh, 120. We distribute it uh, across three nodes, 40, uh, for, 40 uh, VMs per node. Okay. Also in Fedora is 300, it's 100 per, per node. Um, so the minimum memory uh, we in in Windows the memory is two uh, giga uh, two gigabyte. Uh, yes, two gigabyte per uh, per Windows Server Windows Server uh, two thousand nineteen. We plan also to use uh, Windows ten. Um, so today the the main reason that uh, avoid us to uh, use more is the memory because uh, each node we have 128 giga each uh, node to total node um, by the way when we launch the windows vm we there is more memory allocation for each uh, launcher pod. So if you put two giga, so you get two giga, um, 20 and 20 mega. So if you re if you launch more than, uh, so you get to, you will get memory uh, sufficient, insufficient because you reach to the limit. Um, in general, um, so when we run it, we run it in bulk uh, according to the number of the CPU. So if we have uh, in our uh, physical, we have 20 physical core. So we, we run it in bulk of 20. So each time we, each time we, we, we launch uh, 20 uh, VMs. And, and in order to see that it starts on the same exact time, we we run the YAML with uh, running force. So all the VMs will start uh, at the same exact time. And we will do it in a ramp up. What I mean in ramp up, so each time, we add more 20 uh, VMs till we reach uh, uh, in each node, till we reach to the limit in each node, and we continue with the next node. So at the end, we have the all, uh, uh, the all uh, running VM. We, as I said, we collect the Prometheus for each run and we distribute the data into uh, Elasticsearch and share the result into Grafana. So we have a clear result for each uh, nightly run. Is there any question about it? Okay. I, did, I didn't understand how many uh, cores per node, what did you say it was? Uh, the course is 20 physical and hyperfed 40. Okay, 40 and no, or 40 total. And the memory and the memory per node is 128 giga. Yeah. Um, in general, I don't know if it's the right place to share the result, but it's depend of uh, uh, so we we create the distribution of the result uh, and in in general the 
the times uh, look stable. Sometimes we need to investigate why there is intensive uh, memory and all this stuff. But in general, we install uh, the nightly CNV of OpenShift. Okay, so uh, we take the latest version. I guess it should be the latest version version of uh, Qvert, right? From the nightly open shift? I don't know. Yeah. So um, I don't know exactly what uh, the version. Of, I I actually tag the CNV nightly version inside our uh, Grafana dashboard. Okay. So we so that's, have. That's, so that's cool. I I guess like um. So we're gonna. By the way, all the in. logs. Uh, by the way, all the logs we store in S3 bucket. So if we you discuss before that you don't have enough place to keep the logs, so we tar it and upload to Elasticsearch in for future uh, analyze. So we have to, next to each one a link to S3 bucket. So by one click, you got uh, all the logs on your local, so you can do local analyze in order not to save, you know, uh, all the logs uh, locally. Cool. Well, that's pretty awesome. I mean, I, I think um, uh, that's cool. And yeah, as you get like some results from this, you know, let us know. And uh, yeah, like, like, you know, like as you're aware, like we have that's the similar hardware topology on the dedicated cluster. and the tests we're doing aren't quite the same. They're not, they're not, they're not the same. And we're just, you know, we're creating VMs of certain quantities and, and, and analyzing the results. So, I mean, as you get like, um, I mean, what I, what I would actually, what I'm actually curious is like, as you do some of this stuff, um, it would be cool to see, um, you, we have the audit tool that basically scrapes the metrics and will analyze them in such a format like that they can be scraped using the uh, this work that LA is doing for graphs. So you should be able to eventually, um, when, when LA has this published, you should be able to use the audit tool and then build graphs. And it would be cool to see, you know, based on what you're doing here, what else we find, you know, because you're doing nightly, so we should see like, you know, we should be able to compare like what it is you're seeing and maybe we can get some additional data points from it. I know that uh, Marcelo, we, uh, the, there is a dedicated Grafana dashboard in the past that related to the Qvert result. Do you talk about this? No, I mean, so like with, um, so like what, what Alay was showing earlier, like this stuff with um, these metrics, like the HTTP request counts, like mm -hmm. you, you mentioned, like you're looking at the, the amount of memory and the CPU of the node um, and how, how like it's affected by, you know, the, the scale that you're going with. What I was suggesting is that you could also incorporate as part of your analysis that we have the HTTP requests and the the VMI phase transition times. Both those things will give you more insight into performance. And and then one of them's like this one's particularly with scale on the Kubernetes side. And so since when you use the audit tool for this, and I can send you a link afterwards. It's it's mm -hmm. something you can just run locally as part of your uh, your job. It's pretty easy to add in. But and, I can um, run it. Do I need to run it against each VM to get it, uh, the memory? No, no. You just, so what you'll do is you just, when you just run it, after you do your, uh, the way it works is after you do your test. This mm -hmm. is exactly what we do today. So we run our tests and then we run this audit tool. So you do exactly what you're doing today. After you're done, you run this audit tool and it will capture a bunch of this, this stuff from Prometheus and organize it in such a way that, that, mm -hmm. um, that it will, uh, be helpful for doing like performance and scale analysis and that and then when Alay has this stuff you run it done, at the beginning and at the end right to, that it will take the period of uh, right yeah well so what you do is like it, the what uh, the way it works well so what you actually what you do is you run it at the end all you need to do to make this work the only requirement is that you actually create a, a primer for your work mm -hmm. so it's like if you all you do is you create it, it on a new cluster. If you have an old cluster, one that you've used in the past, it doesn't matter. But if you create, what you do is you create one VM before you start. And mm -hmm. then you, you do your whole scale up here with like 300 Fedora VMs. 
you run your audit tool after we're, after you're done over the time period like the that that you want to analyze and it will give you a bunch of um, data about the the client go HTTP requests the VMI transition times and it'll organize it in such a way that you can get the P90s the P95 the P99 the P50 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a bunch of that stuff and then when Elay's Elay's working on this tool that he presented earlier where you can graph this stuff is like because it sounds like you're storing the data somewhere so you should also be able to use this tool to get the point at your persistent storage if you if you store this in some way maybe in plain text somewhere we should be able to scrape it similarly with this tool and you should be able to create graphs from it it's give us the percentile right uh, across all the vms that running on the specific cluster right yeah like it'll tell you could you get like a p99 and a p95 from it or something so the Grafana, by the way, Grafana do it uh, automatically once you, you have can the... get, yeah, you could get this and right. You can get it in Grafana if you want to. The, the point is, or the reason I was mentioning this, like if you wanted to do this programmatically from like, mm -hmm. as a part of like your, like if you wanted to write a bunch of code around the results, like getting, you'd run this tool and then run a bunch of code around it. But you could obviously do this in Grafana, like if you wanted to review each job one by one. Nice. So. It's something embedded in uh, in the client. It's it's not it's it's a it's a part of upstream Qvert. I can I can point you to it. Um, you just use um, you just use um, let's see here. The tool is right here. So uh, you can what you do is you compile it yourself. It's a, there's a mm -hmm. command for it here and um and you can run it oh no okay we compile it in that repo then okay so what you do is you'll um in in here you'll you can compile it in here and um it'll get you a binary and and you can run it um, like I was saying, you can just run it. There's an example. I can point you to an example. Um, I can put in the doc or I can send it to you on Slack afterwards of like how this, how this looks inside the test. It's pretty straightforward. There's some, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually just right here. Like there's some, where's the, where is the data will uh, placed locally when I run it. Yeah. So like it ends up looking like this, um, show you exactly. So we can get more uh, detail inside the cuber, like distribution per block or something like that, not just the memory and the CPU. Yeah, there so what we this is basically what we've done is there's these two metric, there's a few metrics we've added that are specifically geared toward um you know, for example, if VM loading the time of loading take uh 30 seconds. I want to know the distribution of of this 30 second in the cubert itself, how many spend in each uh, in each uh, block uh, in the code. There is also so we no, we don't have that yet. So this is this is actually where some of the enhancements we want to have. So like just to give you an idea of where we are, like so here's like here's what like the output would look like is that you'll get like a, a you'll get like um a, a plain text json dump um to your to your local terminal or you can put it to a file mm -hmm. or whatever and um so this is based on the time period that we ran this here's our p50 from create to running time in seconds our p95 and our p but no, no profile that can give me more details inside no not not yet no so this is what i'm saying it's like this is this is what we have now but there this is actually one of the things we have talked about on our roadmap where like we want to get further into like the vert launcher pod when mm -hmm. like after like so this is right this is to running so if you look at there's the little nuances to this is like we have the phase transition from from scheduled to running like that's the period of like when we're booting the domain and it's showing right. it's ready so that's a whole time period and you could technically track that time period right it's maybe in this case this is the whole thing but maybe it took like eight seconds or something so during that time period technically we could write some metrics 
that could look to track, okay, it took eight seconds. Like what was the breakdown of like, what took eight seconds? Was it the domain being created? Was it the callbacks between the handler and the launcher? Was it something, you know, whatever it is like that, that kind of stuff is what we can create. But my point is like, just showing you kind of what we have today and eventually where we want to break this down and where we could break this down more and how we can output it in a useful way. So what, what we see here is the, what, what it means the threshold value is the... These are, this is, we created this for CI so that like if we over, if we go over the threshold, it will fail the job. So this is the mm -hmm. P50 of 24, if we go over 45. And the the value is the time of creation in a second. Yeah, this is the um, we had. There's the creation timestamp that gets posted on the pod, all the way to when we see the running the 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 uh, VMI is running. Okay, so so for this time we already have it. We we have the expose v. We we do expose VM and test yeah. when. If first log in and get the, the total time. You say that when we run it, what the overhead we can get if we run it against our uh, VMs? So um, let me jump a little bit in here. Uh, um, yeah. Brian, if you can scroll up a little bit. Uh, so the, the value, start. yeah, but that's it, that's it. Okay. So okay. the value of that, this, tool in my opinion is that you get an aggregation right that um creation to running p95 timestamp is 45 seconds or or something right you get that uh, you can get that even without this tool but um in the cubeword stack a lot of time is being spent uh, in making these api calls these api calls are made against these API calls are made by Kubert to Kubernetes API server. And right. you can correlate whether um, the creation to running P95 has gone up or gone down or you know stayed there based on the aggregation of these API calls, right? So you can say, okay, um, P95 creation to running has gone up because we are making more list calls, which are being expensive in our reconcile loop. And that's why it has gone up. So mm -hmm. this is the first level of breakdown um, that you can only get. Only the P95, right? This is the breakdown only of the P95, right? No, well, no. So it's not really a, a total breakdown, but it's more of a way to understand the, um, scaling behavior of kubert itself so you can correlate data the next thing as ryan was mentioning was to actually do a breakdown of that uh, creation to running right so, so the time what i see here in the value is the time in millisecond no here the value is the number of get calls made by kubert ah it's just the calls not the total time right yes just the calls so how, how can I know from the calls, the number of the calls, if it's good or not? Because you know, you can call something and it's call and it's take nanosecond and you call, you can call once and it can, can take uh, 30 millisecond. So it, it great distribution, but we need the time for each one we can get or no? Um, we we can get, and that's something in, in the roadmap, but the value of this is that you can understand the scaling behavior of KubeWord. So we can look at this data and say, okay, if we uh, scale up to 1000 VMIs, we are getting 4000 get endpoints count, um, and Kubernetes will not work well in our environment with 400 uh 4000 get get endpoints you say or, or something all more than than expected so you know that something is going wrong in this uh, in this uh, section called the rise yes correct so, so this helps us understand the scaling behavior and predict whether 
um, Kubernetes will be able to handle this or the stack will be able to handle this. The performance behavior that you are talking about is to exact breakdown of each of the uh, phase into smaller components is something that we would have to uh, work on. Um, so if I run, you say it against our uh, scale VM, this is running against one VM, what we see here, or? No, this is aggregation that is monitored in the KubeWord client. So what will happen is any anytime you create a bunch of VMs, right? A uh, KubeWord client will increment each of the uh, value when it makes the call. So mm -hmm. when it makes the create pod call, it will increment the Prometheus counter. At the end, the audit tool, like Ryan said, he, the audit tool will look at all the increment value and report the, the data back. Okay. Okay. So I think, um, so I just need to get a way how to run it and we'll try it on our uh, cluster. Yeah. I think it can be great uh, starting. It's like mini profile, I, I can call it a mini profile yeah. against uh, the I, total you, call, right? The way, the, way I, the way I characterize it, Eli, is like our thesis is that we're looking at performance and scale sort of related things. And, and, and that if you were in the traditional virtualization world, right, when you're launching your virtual machine, you're very focused on the performance of like how long it takes from like when I created the domain to the point that I have it available to me, right? That's That's critical. But as like what I'm saying is part of our thesis is that there's so much more happening here and that's what this illustrates is like, we have to deal with Kubernetes, the Kubernetes layer, the the Kubernetes control client. And then we have to deal with the, the actual virtual machine. And so all those things together is what ultimately affects our quote unquote performance, because that's what we're dealing with with Kubernetes. And so what we're doing is here is we're, we're taking the Kubernetes and the Kubernetes control plane portions, and we're sort of factoring that into our analysis. And then we're also doing the part which you're emphasizing, which is, or we're trying to get to the point where you're emphasizing where like we want to get to the breakdown of like, just like the domain and the virtual machine, how quickly that the guest is ready when we actually, you know, when going to find the domain to when it's actually yes, available for the user. So I think that uh, there, I, I think that this this is not come embedded inside the cuber, so I thought maybe it should be like configuration file. Let's say okay, enable it or not enable it. Something that running by um, HTTP outside the cuber. No, it's it's this is by this is on by default. These are metrics already in um, provided by default when you install cuber. Oh, we're doing like so you can get this you can in your cluster right now you can get this in your prometheus you can look at these values we're just ag we're, what we're doing here is we're 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 analyzing them in a useful way and this by the way like getting it they getting this stuff is is not easy like there's a you can i can show you the formula to doing it the like, kind of the right way because it's a little bit complicated because you have to do by the way it's all organized to to get this right. down, or you just uh, list all it's, it's I, I don't know if there's a specific, I think we just do it by alphabetically, like what the verb is. I, I think it's how it ends up. It's the best organized. practice, uh, you know, in my last company, we, when we enable profiler, we put it from uh, up and down, but it's never mind. You, we can do it uh, later to read sure. it. And... Yeah. Well, I, anyway, I just wanted to mention this as uh, something you can add as an addendum because it, there's mm -hmm. a bunch of data that we can that we can capture and i just wanted to mention it because i think it'll be useful to see like when you want to bring your your data like you did here to this meeting it would be cool to also see this as a comparison to what we're seeing and in, in some, right. some of the tests we have well sure because we can have more uh, details uh around uh, across all the blocks, uh, code blocks that uh, calling. Sure. I wonder if 
when we use them, um, maybe it can, oh, yes, when we run um, like the 100 VMs, so all be dependent on, on how much calls we have. So I think that the numbers will be the same. But at the end, when we, if we want to add it to our nightly, so we can see the, uh, the behavior across the run. So if there is the, in there is a one run peak, so we can find that there is issue, maybe this method or something like that. Yeah. So, so if we can see the gradation in the result, we can connect it to the specific block that maybe call a lot of time and can cause it, right? Yeah, I think it, it'll give us some, a lot more data to compare. And, and it will be very seasons. difficult to add the, the time for it. Um, like you're talking about like the, like what I was saying, like the specific domain, like how long it takes to, for it to be running or something like that. Yes, but you're asking. each block here, you have the count, right? And we don't, and no option to get the total time, how much time it's run. The whole job there it, it is recorded. not the old job, not or, the old job, or just the, the VMIs, specific, like uh, the specific method. This is the method have, inside or class. I don't know. It's class, right? No. Okay. We have. I mean, this is what we have today. We just use the transition times to get the P95s, P50, and 99s. But mm. I mean, the like I was saying, there's there's further breakdowns we can do here in a lot of different directions from just the domain being launched, the networking, there's lots of stuff we can do. Um, but I mean, that's, we started with this because this is something that gives us yes. an easy on-ramp. But yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is things we want to add. Yes, it, um, so for, for now, we I guess that we just starting to get these data. So I think that once, and we'll see any improvement or degradation so we can see it over time. So we, we just started it last month to enable what we, what I discussed, what, what actually uh, we discussed before. So yeah. we don't have enough data to, you know, for investigation, but um, uh, this week, uh, there is also the PerfConf and also the uh, the Qvert uh, Summit. So there's a lot of things. Uh, so I was busy around. Uh, so I think that uh, next month, uh, beginning of April, I have more time to do the investigation around it and to, you know, to first, this tool can help us to know the distribution and for sure I will try it on my uh, side and also to what we discussed last meeting and uh, to enhance the upstream, try to enhance and to understand more sure. uh, about the performance test in the upstream side. Sure, okay. Well, I, we got we got two minutes left, so I want to go to the next topic. Um, I'll lay this one for you. We have the KWAC question. Let, let's let's go to this one. Sure. So why does no controller not race with the KWAC controller? I think we had that last time. Do you have the yeah, answer to this I, one? Is that what you have here? Yes, yes. Um, so this yeah. was one of the questions raised in the last discussion, and um, I I took the time to figure out what what's happening here. So really quickly summarizing this. Um, the kubelet controls a set of conditions on the node status. Um, the node controller only looks at the heartbeat time. And if a uh, kubelet has not posted a heartbeat for some timeout period, then the node controller will add uh, a taint to the pods that are running on, on that. And it will basically terminate the the pods with with uh, with taint value no execute. So basically, what I'm trying to say is the kubelet owns those status conditions. The node controller reads from those status conditions and takes a bunch of uh, actions. 
the reason why it does not interfere with the KWOK controller is that the KWA controller becomes the fake kubelet and it owns those status conditions instead. And because it runs a regular heartbeat on, on those status conditions, the node controller thinks that the node is healthy and it will not do anything with it. Okay. I think yeah. I understand. So it replaces the kubelets part, not the node controller. Correct. Yes. Okay. So that's why it doesn't race. I see. Yeah. Um, I actually did not get time to prepare a demo for this. Maybe we, I can get it going the next next time. Yeah, we can aim for we can aim for another time. Maybe maybe next week or the week after. Sure. Okay, sounds good, Alay. Okay, I right, we're at time, everyone. Thanks very much for the discussion. This is great. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we'll see you <laughs> later. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. bye, -bye. bye.